why pick, why one religion? Why can't you take them all? Yes, absolutely. I think he was a great man. I don't think he's the son of God. I think Jesus was a hippie. He follows Jesus Christ, not the church. I don't follow the church. That's what I want to talk about, because Jesus Christ was the, the son of God, and he didn't, and he didn't back down for nobody. I believe in a, yeah, I believe in a higher power. Christians who say, uh, I'm right, I think they're fools. I think, I think a lot of it is the difference I feel in just in art, you know, unless like it reaches its end or purpose. Like, you know, you participate in one endeavor, and if its end is to glorify God, it feels, there feels like there's something significant that transpires there, as opposed to um, if its end is to glorify the artist, maybe, or to glorify even art, you know, that's a lot of times art is an end in itself. Yeah, we all worship stuff, you know, we all worship something, and um, the things that we worship compete constantly for our affections, and there's a difference in placing your affections in a thing that can't satisfy, and placing your affections in, 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 in a person that can, and um, that would be why I choose to follow Jesus, is because of the satisfaction I'm afforded, and, and place my affections I think ultimately, though, what you take away from the person of Christ is love. It's, it's, it's the ultimate healing moment for us and for creation is the person of Christ seven foot. And, um, and, and yeah, we've, we've twisted that moment quite often, um, but it's ultimately our salvation. Um, so if I was to make a case as an artist, it would be that, that I'm, I'm much more satisfied um, in the process and even the result of art when, when the person of Christ is its end, and to, to tell the story of the person of Christ is, is a much more satisfying endeavor than to tell another story. Well, as we get into this issue of worship, we'll start with a weird story that I hope to tie together. Uh, I'm kind of a sports freak. I like baseball a lot. Uh, I like uh, basketball quite a bit, and I also like football. And uh, I also like ultimate fighting, and I was pretty bummed that Matt Hughes last night lost his uh, belt uh, to a Canadian. So uh, <laughs> be in prayer for that. Uh, but I, uh, and one of the things that bums me out of being a pastor, I love being a pastor, but Sundays are when all the good games are, and I praise God for TiVo, but you also never get to go to a game. And so as a pastor, I never get to go to a football game except for Monday night football. Uh, and so recently, uh, Hawks played the Raiders Monday night football game. Very, very happy because a guy in the church uh, called up, said, hey, I got an extra ticket. Do you want to go to the Hawks game Monday night game? It's like, yeah, that's my only shot to ever go to a game is a Monday night game unless I call in sick. But that's not very good because I'm the pastor and then I'd have to discipline myself. So I, yeah, I'll go to the Monday night game alone. So we went to the Monday night game and, and it was amazing because it was it was during the most torrential downpour that Seattle has ever seen, right? We had mudslides and floods, and people are quoting the Old Testament. I mean, it's just crazy time. And, uh, and you have to park miles away from the stadium and still pay for parking, whole nother zip code. Then you have to walk. You have to walk in the rain, driving wind. You finally get to the parking lot where all the important people learn the secret on how to park at the stadium park, and then there's lifeguards on duty in the parking lot, and you're sort of sloshing through to get there. You get to the stadium, and the stadium is huge, $450 million, $300 million of which was uh, given by tax dollars and public dollars. Uh, I'm not sure why they couldn't afford a roof. Anyways, uh, 450 million bucks, seems like you should get a roof for that deal. Uh, then you go in, and uh, you look at your ticket, and you uh, try to figure out where you sit, and it says, just keep going until you see Jesus. And so you just go up and up and up and up and up and up and up to what Paul calls the third heaven to the Corinthians. 
you're like, hey, there's Jesus. I must be right around here because he's the only guy sitting any higher than you. So you just, and you go all the way up. And most football fans are not athletes, right? I mean, <laughs> these people are not built for stairs, you know? I mean, it's like, <gasps> I mean, they're just, they're dying, you know, and they need a Sherpa to carry all their beer and stuff. You know, I mean, it's not good. So you finally get to the top level and then you go in and you show the usher your little ticket and they give you oxygen and put the defibrillator on your chest. And then they point you a little further north. You got to go up some more stairs and you finally get to your seat, driving wind, rain, huge plasma screen TVs, loud 70,000 people there. It's televised and you finally get to your seat and you think, Gosh, this is so great. I get a seat. You sit down, but then Pete and repeat in front of you, they're super fans. They're wearing jerseys. They're dressed up like birds that don't exist. And, and they're going to stand up the whole game because they're super fans. It's like, oh boy. So then I'm thinking, why did we pay for the seat? We're never going to sit in the seat because I can't see the game over Pete and repeat. And, uh, and I was glad to have a bad seat because it was actually covered and we stayed dry. But about midway through the first quarter, looking at 70,000 people, young women half naked dancing in the rain, men colliding into one another, television cameras, loud music, video screen, everyone dressed up, drunken frenzy. People have spent thousands of dollars for one beer and one hot dog. Um, <laughs> now their kids can't even go to college, you know? And, uh, and it occurred to me, I joined a cult. That, that's what <laughs> dawned on me. I have joined a cult. This is a cult um, with bad colors, you know? And, uh, and I was thinking, what if you took somebody from another culture or maybe a Hebrew from the Old Testament and you plopped them in at this game, they would think this is the biggest religion in the country. And we were at the biggest church in America, 70,000 people, $450 million building, people walking miles to get there. And I thought, this is a worship event. That's what this is. That's why everyone is screaming and yelling and wearing the colors and dressed up again like a bird that does not exist. And because uh, there is no such thing as a Seahawk. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, so uh, in the middle of about the first quarter, it dawned on me, oh no, I've joined a cult. And I started thinking about this conversation I had in Vishakapatnam, East India, a few years ago. And uh, there I went to teach some pastors out in the rural areas. They were all Hindu converts living in these little villages. And I remember seeing the craziest worship. I mean, people all dressed up, their faces painted, devoted to their gods, whole days of festivals and feasts, and, and people down at the uh, water washing themselves to have their sins forgiven. And as you walk from village to village, there's these little sort of huts on the roadside. And if you go in them, there's a little god in there or a goddess for the area or for your vocation, or your family, and they're everywhere, lots of gods. And there's food and there's gifts to the gods and all these little presents for the gods. And then there's chicken blood and feathers everywhere. Apparently the gods like to whack chickens or something. And so there's just chicken whacking going on in all of these little huts, these little shrines. And I went to teach the uh, Hindu convert pastors uh, under this thatch roof. It was, it was super hot. And uh, a bunch of them came up and we were visiting. And one of the uh, pastor's wives came up and we were visiting. Very nice, cool, bright gal. And she said, uh, oh, is this your first time to India? I said, yeah. And I said, have you ever been to America? She says, well, I went once. I said, do you ever think you'll go again? She says, I don't think I'll go again. I said, why? She said, I just can't handle the idolatry. I thought, the idol? You're the chicken whackers. What? <laughs> you know? But then I thought, well, they got a little thing. We got a $450 million thing. They whack a few chickens. We dress up like chickens. It's probably not that different, <laughs> right? And it's amazing sometimes what we consider hobby or sport or recreation or just personal, you know, individual life activity that we find enjoyable. Somebody from another culture or another period of time, their angle on it is that's religious, you're being spiritual, that's a worship event that's ongoing in that place that the, the band is playing there or that the, uh, uh, the sports event is happening there, those kind of things. So I want you, as we get into it, the worship of Jesus, I want you to have a big, broad picture of worship that sometimes is, is much bigger than what we would consider just worship. And by worship, I, I don't mean something that is just for religious or spiritual people, right? right? I mean, people who stay up all night and play World of Warcraft. That's kind of a little religion. Uh, you know, people who sleep outside all night for PlayStation 3, uh, you know, this week. Uh, that's kind of a religious thing. It's, it's, it's a devotion issue. It's a, it's a giving of oneself and one's money and one's time. Uh, the people who stay outside months in advance to watch the latest 
Star Wars movie. Uh, that, that is kind of religious devotion. Same with a band. If you're going to buy all the shirts and go to all the shows and sing all the songs and dress like the lead singer, uh, that's kind of a worship experience. That is something that is not just Christian or religious or spiritual, but it is worshipful in nature. Secondly, worship is not just a music style. Sadly, sometimes in Christianity, there's something known as the worship wars, and I don't think it's really a war. I'm not sure anyone's died over hymns versus acoustic praise. I I don't know how many casualties we have, you know, and I'm not sure what the body count is in the worship war, but they call it the worship war, and sometimes it's older people like the organ and the hymns, and the younger people like the, you know, the prom songs to Jesus and the acoustic guitar, And, uh, and what happens is there's sort of a conflict over which style or genre of music is most worshipful. And when we're talking about worship, it includes music, but it's a much broader, bigger issue than just a style or genre of music. Thirdly, worship is not something that starts and stops. It's not like when we get done here, you don't have to worship again till next week, right? It's something that's ongoing and ceaseless and continuous and a lifestyle. And lastly, worship is not tied to a time or a place. Jesus had this conversation in John chapter four with a woman from an area called Samaria. And she said, well, where should we worship? There's, you know, there's a temple here, there's a temple here. Jesus said, it's not where, it's who. That's really the issue. Worshipers worship in spirit by the Holy Spirit and in truth according to scripture. And he says, it's not where you worship, it's who you worship and how you worship. That's what counts. And so at Mars Hill, we don't believe that this building is holier than some other building. We don't believe that when we come together here, this is the, 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 the sacred place, any more so than your house is a sacred place. We don't believe that the holy lands are necessary more holy. We believe that everywhere belongs to God and everywhere can be a sacred place in which God is worshiped and honored and glorified by the people who are there. And so we don't believe it's tied to a time. We don't believe it's just tied to a place. We don't believe it's just tied to a genre of music or that it is just tied to a religious or a spiritual people. That being said, we'll start with a definition of worship and then we'll proceed into the worship of Jesus. And I'll start in Romans 11, 36 and move to Romans 12, 1. And I wanna tie a few concepts for you together there. Uh, Paul says this, uh, Romans eleven thirty six 36, to him, that's to God, be the glory forever. God has no beginning or end and the glory is to be God's forever. So I want you to keep that word glory in mind. We're going to, examine that in great detail. That'll be one of the mega themes of scripture that we study together this evening. Amen. He says, therefore, I urge you brothers in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. We'll revisit that issue of sacrifice. Holy and pleasing to God, this is your spiritual act of worship. Okay. So here's what he is saying. We hold something in a position of glory and whatever we hold in the position of glory, a person or thing, We then worship that thing or person that we hold in the position of glory, and we do so by making sacrifices, okay? So let me start by first explaining what we mean by glory. It means weightiness, the most important, significant, preeminent, prominent priority in your life, the greatest treasure, your deepest longing, the source of your hope and joy. That is what you hold in the position of glory. And I'm saying that we all are worshipers because we all hold something, be that ourselves, a relationship, a pet, a spouse, a car, a hobby, an experience, an income, an education, a house, whatever it is, there's something that gets us out of bed in the morning. There's something that our hearts and minds long for. There's someone or something that is the most important someone or something in the world to us. Functionally, whoever or whatever that is, that is our God. Secondly, we then worship that person or thing. And we do that by making sacrifices. And you could tell what your functional real God is by looking at what you make sacrifices for. You only have so many hours in a day and you'll sacrifice certain activities to put your time toward this person or thing. We only have so many dollars to spend. And by examining how we spend our money, that helps to indicate what is in the position of preeminence or glory in our life because we're sacrificing money. We're not spending it on certain people or things because we want to allocate those resources toward that person or thing that we hold in the position of glory. 
Now, practically, let me give you some examples of what this looks like. We can worship people. We can worship things. We can hold, for example, let's say your, your glorious position is occupied by your stomach. Paul says for some people, their God is their stomach. What do you end up doing? Eating a lot. Worshiping. Taking your money and spending it on food, taking your time, devoting it to food, and eating far beyond what you should, becoming a glutton, thereby making your stomach your God and making sacrifices of your health, making sacrifices of your well-being, so that you can worship your stomach. If you are someone who holds in the position of glory, for example, sex, then what you do is you make sacrifices about holiness, chastity, fidelity, marriage. You make all kinds of sacrifices for holiness and sacrifices in your intimacy with God so that you can then worship sex. And that's what you do. You live your life making sacrifices to worship that which you hold in the position of glory. I've seen I've seen guys worship cars. I'll give you an example. Uh, old guy, guys sometimes like to work on old cars. I've seen guys get old cars and want to renovate them. And what they end up doing is holding that car in the position of glory. Next thing you know, it's like, hey, how come you don't go to church? I don't have time. Sunday's my day off. I'm working on my car. Why don't you go to Bible study? Well, that's an evening that I've devoted to my car. I can't go to Bible study anymore. Right? Wife, kids come out. Hey, can you come in for dinner? We're a family. Sorry, I don't have time. I'm working on my car, right? I'm making sacrifices. I, I don't connect with God or wife or children. Why? Because the car is in the position of glory and I'll sacrifice everyone and everything else, my time, my sleep, my friends, my family, my God, to what? To, to glorify the car. I mean, it's amazing. We do this with sports, we do this with food, we do this with alcohol, we do this with sex, we do this with relationships, we do this with bands, we do this with hobbies. I'm saying that we're all incredibly spiritual people and we're all worshiping. I'll give you another example. Say there's a gal who knows Jesus and knows Jesus doesn't want her to see anybody who's not someone that also loves Jesus. She meets a guy and she puts that guy in the position of glory. He's the most important thing in the world. Next thing you know, she's not going to Bible study. She's not going to church. She's not walking with Jesus. She's not keeping her clothes on like she's supposed to. She's doing all kinds of things she shouldn't. Why? Because she's made sacrifices to worship that guy. And he now is the one who holds glory in her life. And this is how it works. This is how it happens. And so my, my simple point in all of this is not that some of you are not worshipers and some of you are. The only difference is the object of our worship. Romans 125 says we either worship the creator who made us and everything else, or we worship created things. Created things can be things that God made. We could worship the environment and be radical environmentalists. We can be sexual addicts who worship the human body. We can be gluttons who worship food that God made good. We can be alcoholics and drunkards who worship alcohol that God made for us to consume. Yet we can do so in such a way that even the good things that God made become bad things because they become gods to us. And he says, if we don't worship the things that God made, we also will just worship things that we've made, right? I mean, you ever been into a house, you walk in and all the chairs face what? The enormous television. Human beings do not speak to one another. They gather around the box. I mean, it's interesting. I've had Christian friends say, I went into my Hindu friend's house or my Buddhist friend's house and they have a little shrine right in the middle of the living room and everyone looks at it. It's really weird. I'm like, does it have a remote? I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, sometimes we only see the idolatry in the culture of another person. Don't see that we sometimes repeat the same errors that others do because we just think that's entertainment, that's our culture, that's the way that we do things, it's normative for us. We worship created things. This as well can be as simple as a pet. Okay, I love Muffy and Fluffy and Buffy. I love all animals, I'm pro-animal, right? Uh, but you can get to the point where you say, well, I don't go to church on Sunday because I gotta go to the dog show and I can't go to Bible study because we got obedience classes. And next thing you know, you've sacrificed relationship with Christians and growing in your faith for what? For Muffy, Fluffy, and Buffy. I've seen whole marriages fall apart because the, the animal became more important than the marriage and in the end, it was a bitter custody dispute over the dog. Like, what? It's like we're, we're fighting over who's gonna carry the bag and follow it around. Like, 
Like, somebody's got to think this through, you know? We made, a, we made a wrong turn somewhere when we're going to slaughter the marriage for the show dog. But I've seen it happen. And what I'm saying is that the human heart just craves, desires, yearns, longs for worship. And we either worship the creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, or we worship created things like pets and, and you know, nature and, and the human body or food or drink or things that we've made like a, a nice TV or a raise at work or a sports team or a hobby or a, a favorite band or an activity and such. Let me, let me come at it from another angle. Martin Luther, the great reformer, says that... Uh, that if you study the Ten Commandments, you will realize that the first two commandments are the most important, and if you obey the first two commandments, you'll never break the other eight, okay? Let me explain this to you. First commandment is what? There's one God. Second commandment, we're only supposed to worship that God. What he says is, if we only had one God, Jesus, and if we only worship that God, Jesus, then we wouldn't have to worry about the other sins because those are the result of breaking the first two commandments. Let me explain this to you. Bible says, don't lie. Why do we lie? Because I want everyone to think that I'm a good person. I want to give a good impression. I want my glory to shine forth and I don't want anyone to think bad about me. Okay, so now I'm my own God and my glory is the most important thing. And I will worship my glory by telling lies so that even if I've done something wrong, I try and cover it up and hide it. And even if I haven't done something right, I'll lie about it and say that I did because my, my God is me and my reputation. How about this one? The Bible says don't commit adultery. That's one of the commandments. The other eight. You say, well, how do you not commit adultery? Well, if Jesus is my God and I worship him alone, I'm not going to sleep with somebody I'm not married to. But if sex is my God or nudity is my God, then I will worship that God. And so the problem is never that I just lack holiness or self-control or self-discipline. The issue is always I picked a wrong God and I'm worshiping it. That's why I keep doing the wrong things. I'll give you another example. Uh, don't steal. You say, why do we steal? Because if you love something, you will worship it by stealing it, taking it because you have to have it. You've now made that thing more important than God. You're willing to sacrifice relationship with God to commit a sin, to have the thing you can't live without. And in so doing, you're saying, I will reject God and steal the thing because the thing is more important to me than God. And so now I'm a thief. I think Luther's got a tremendous insight that the opposite of worship is not atheism, but it's idolatry, that we all worship. The only issue is, do we have one God and worship him alone or did we pick someone or something else's God and then we worship it, which leads to all the problems like sex that is sinful, coveting, stealing, lying, murder, whatever it might be. All the other sins are the result of confusing the first two commandments to have one God alone and to worship that God alone. Question is, how do we get out of this loop where we're all worshipers? And I want you to see where we're all passionate worshipers, our money, our time, our energy, we make sacrifices for people. We make sacrifices for things, for causes, for improvements in our health, for improvements in our parents, for a raise at work, for the approval of our boss, for a bigger house, a nicer car, for a better income, for our favorite band, for our favorite sporting event, for our cause, for our pet, for our spouse, for our kids. We just give ourselves to something we just can't help ourselves. Say, so how do we get out of this loop where, where we're worshipers and we just always worship something or someone other than God? The key to begin with is to find a worshiper who doesn't do that and to examine the life of that worshiper and ask, okay, what does correct worship look like where there's one God and you worship him alone and that keeps you out of all of the other trouble that you can fall into? That leads us to Jesus. And then we, we learn to worship like Jesus. Jesus is the perfect worshiper, the best worshiper who has ever lived. And so we must look at Jesus and ask, Jesus, how did you worship? And from that, we can learn what it is to be a good worshiper. Now, theologically, let me set this up. As Christians, we believe there is one God and three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We call it the Trinity. And we believe that this one God in three persons is eternal without beginning or end and that there is mutual love, submission, glory, honoring, communication, affection, adoration between the Father, Son, and Spirit. So Jesus, the second member of the Trinity, he glorifies God the Father and God the Father glorifies Jesus and the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus and the Father and there's this mutual glorying 
uh, adoration, praise, love, respect, intimacy, oneness within the Trinitarian character of God. As such, Jesus, as eternal God, is the perfect worshiper who from eternity past has been glorified by the Father and the Spirit and has been glorifying the Father and the Spirit. Jesus says this regarding the glorification, the worship, the glorying that occurs between him and the Father twice in John 17. One is in verse five where he says, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus says, in eternity past, I was the second member of the Trinity and the Father glorified me and he gave glory to me. We worshiped one another in this perfect, unbroken, ceaseless, worshiping community. He says the same thing in John 17, 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the creation of the world. Same thing. That glory and worship, again, go together. The word worship is sometimes translated sacrifice because worship is simply what you make sacrifices for. So again, whatever is in the position of glory is your functional God, and then we worship that thing of glory or that person of glory by making sacrifices of our time and our money and our energy and our focus and our ability, we give to it. And Jesus says, the Father glorified me in eternity past. There is this glorying relationship between the Father and the Son that is unbroken, that is unchanging, that is unending. And so Jesus is the perfect worshiper. And what we see is that Jesus worshiped God the Father in all of his life, every day, every place, every situation, every opportunity. That's why he never sinned. Sin, one way to define sin is, is living in such a way or acting or thinking in such a way that doesn't glorify God, that breaks that ceaseless uh, intention of worship so that we're no longer glorifying God, we're glorifying someone or something else, maybe just ourselves. But if we worship without ceasing, then we won't be sinning. And the opposite of worship is sin. It's worshiping someone or something else. And so as Jesus worships in all of his life and he doesn't sin and he continues this unbroken, unceasing uh, life of connection and worship with the Father, we then are to follow Jesus, we're to worship like Jesus, we're to, we're to follow the pattern and example of Jesus the worshiper. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians 6, 10 and 20, 31. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for what? The glory of God. Right, so when you're eating, say, how can I eat in such a way that glorifies God? How can I drink in such a way that glorifies God? Jesus ate and Jesus drank in a way that glorified God, not sinful. Right, when you're working your job, when you're going to your cubicle, when you're studying for an exam, when you're cutting your grass, when you're, when you're cleaning your dishes after dinner, all of those are opportunities to glorify God. When you're driving in traffic, right? See, this is where it gets real intense for me. This is where it, because I, I here, a little side note, I personally think that everyone's cell phone number should also be their license plate number. That's just my thought, so that I could call them and sort of tell them what I think they should do and where they should go. And uh, because everywhere we are and everything we're doing is an opportunity to glorify or not glorify God, to worship God or to commit idolatry by not honoring and glorifying God. And what he says, whatever you're doing, okay, this literally does mean that when you're cutting your grass, when you're walking your pet, when you're cleaning your dishes, when you're working your job, there is always an opportunity there to glorify God, to worship God in whatever it is we're doing. And Jesus worshiped, he glorified the Father in all aspects of his life. He was a ceaseless worshiper and that is the pattern that we are to follow, glorifying God in everything. So the first thing I wanna say is that we're all worshipers. The only question is what or who is the object of our worship? Secondly, we should worship like Jesus. Otherwise, we will find ourselves committing idolatry, worshiping someone other than God, someone in addition to God or God in a way that God did not approve of. But as we go to worship like Jesus, what we find is that we can't. We have this problem of sin which prohibits us from being the kind of worshipers that Jesus was and is. 
And so not only must we worship like Jesus, we can only worship through Jesus. And here's, here's why we find ourselves in this difficult predicament. Genesis 3, 5, our enemy comes to our first parents, Adam and Eve, and says, you don't need God, be your own God. You don't need to honor God, honor yourself. You don't need to glorify God, glorify yourself. You don't need to worship God, worship yourself, be your own God, glorify yourself, worship yourself, make your own truth, live your own life, be an independent, self-willed, you know, free-willing person that has autonomy to do whatever you please. It's not about God, it's about you. And our first parents bought that lie and every person since has bought that lie. The result is that we're all still worshipers because we were all made to worship, yet rather than going out to worship God, we tend to, as Luther says elsewhere, bend in and just worship myself. So what I want is my happiness, my glory, my joy, my fame, my way, my approval, my friends. I want the world to meet my needs. I want, you know, I want affirmation that builds my esteem and we bend in on ourselves and we just worship ourselves and we glory ourselves and we serve ourselves. And the result is that we absolutely all together can lose sight of God. And here's why we do it we think it'll make us happy. That's, it's just that simple. And we live in a country that was founded for life, liberty, and the pursuit of what? Happiness. I mean, it, it's in the job description for the average American. Why do we do this? Why do we worship people, things, such as ourselves, other than God? Well, we think it'll make us happy. And you know what? It doesn't. Some of you are probably thinking, okay, you're telling me to not have sex with my girlfriend, not get drunk, not get high, and to stop playing World of Warcraft all the time. What will I do for fun? Let me ask you, is it fun? Truly, if you're a Christian, is it fun? Do you have joy? How many of you thought, my God is my stomach, I will worship it now. I will eat and eat and eat. I will go to the buffet and I will find out how many shrimp I can eat. I will know, <laughs> right? And you eat, and how many of you at the end of a gluttonous run did not have joy? You're like, ooh. You feel like that scene from The Exorcist, right? You're like, that, I, you, you feel grow. You just, it doesn't work. Gluttony, does gluttony lead to joy? It doesn't. How about drunkenness? You say, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna get drunk, I'm gonna have a great time. Is drunkenness fun? How many of you hugging the toilet bowl were like, happy, 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 happy am I. I am so ha happy. That's not a happy place. Nothing happy ever happens there. <laughs> Nothing happens there that's ever happy. That's not a happy place. When you end up there, that's God's way of saying, this is not the happy place you were hoping for at the beginning of the night. You started with a rum and coke and you end up here and you know, sort of purgatory. It stinks and it's bad. You don't want to be there, right? How many of you, you started dating someone, you knew you weren't supposed to date, but you chose to glorify them instead of God, thinking this will make me happy, and then it all goes sideways, and you're sleeping together, and you don't know how to get out of it, and it's an emotional wreck, and it's a train wreck, and it's a nightmare, and you're like, this just isn't working, I'm not happy, and this is what happens. We go into something thinking that this will glorify me and make me happy, and then it doesn't work, because sin leads to what? Death. It never leads to joy. The great lie is that sin, worship of someone or something other than God will lead to joy. And so what happens is we tend to try one thing other than God. We're not happy, so we exchange it for something else. It doesn't work. We try something else. Some of you change your appearance. You change your identity. You change your friends. You change your job. Change your house. Change your car. Change everything. It's just this moving from one false God to another false God to the wrong worship to another form of wrong worship, all the while giving it a run, realizing at the end that it's just a fairy tale that there is joy at the end of that pursuit. That's why people tend to be unhappy. Now, let me say this. Only through the worship of the creator God, the Lord Jesus, is their joy. And I am not saying that if you love Jesus, don't eat, don't drink, don't make love, don't drive, don't have a hobby, right? Just wear a burlap sack, sleep on the ground in a cave somewhere, you know, and beat yourself every Tuesday, you know, to make sure that you live a life of misery. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is this. When I worship creator, I then get to rightly enjoy created things. That means I can eat, but I don't need to be a glutton because my God is not my stomach, my God is Jesus, 
Right? That means I can drink, but I don't need to be a drunkard because alcohol is not my God that rules and lords it over me, controls me. I can have one drink or no drinks, depending upon your conscience, and say no and have freedom. That means that you can get married and you can love and enjoy your spouse without being disappointed because they were your God and they were gonna make you happy and they were gonna make you a fulfilled, satisfied, glorified person and then they sinned against you and left the lid up and ruined everything, <laughs> which is what we do, ladies. And, and, and you're gonna marry a sinner and if your hope is that they will give me joy, then they will fall short and you will be disappointed. And if you think that you're going to have a kid and your kid is going to make you happy, well, they're sinners and they're going to disappoint. And what a terrible weight it is to put on a kid. Kid comes out, all you got to do is glorify me and make me happy. It's a lot of pressure for a sinner. Weighs eight pounds. That's a lot. You're asking too much. Joy comes from God. Pleasure, the psalmist says, is in the right hand of God. Joy and pleasure and satisfaction and identity and contentedness comes by worshiping creator and that rightly allows us to enjoy creation. You can love your kids without worshiping them as little gods. You can like your pet without worshiping it as a god. You can work your job. You can go to school. You can enjoy your favorite band. You can go to a Monday night football game. You can enjoy your life on the earth, eating and drinking and laughing and loving without committing idolatry without putting someone or something in the position of God to the degree where they are bound to fail you and you're just sent into this cycle of despair and sadness and grief. I'll tell you why I'm a Christian because I just want to be happy. I'll just let you in on a little secret. The happiest for me is when I'm worshiping Jesus. It means I can eat without being a glutton. I can drink without being a drunkard. I can enjoy intimacy with my wife without expecting her to be my God and to meet all of my needs and, and to make sure that all of my glory is shining forth because it's not about that. It's an opportunity to glorify God by loving her. It's an opportunity to glorify God by raising my kids. It's an opportunity to glorify God by eating my sandwich, you know, cutting my grass and doing my dishes. And, and the key is that some of us still believe that lie, that somehow there's joy apart from creator God and that real joy is to be found in created things. I'm not saying abstain from the things of this earth, but I am saying that if they're not in the right position, you will just be miserable. That's just the way that it works. That's just the way that it works. And so as we worship Jesus, creator, we're able to freely enjoy creation. Now, we worship like Jesus, we worship through Jesus, and ultimately, we worship Jesus, okay? Now, we're Christians, we worship Jesus, and I don't say God or Lord or, you know, the big guy in the sky, I don't say that kind of stuff, because in our city, there's a lot of people who believe in God, and they don't mind if you say God, but we worship Jesus, we want to be really clear about that, we're about Jesus, right? I had a blogger recently start counting how many times I say Jesus in a sermon and they made fun of me. So Jesus, 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 there's some more. Um, and it, it was just nice to find a blogger who could count. Anyways, um, when we're talking about Jesus, we're, we're naming our God. We want it to be clear. We're not just some God out there or there's a lot of gods and you just get to pick one that works for you or there's a lot of different paths or options. The Buddha said there's 84,000 paths to enlightenment. No, there's Jesus. That's what we believe. That we worship like Jesus, we worship through Jesus, and we worship Jesus. See, the problem is, is that because of idolatry, we're bent in ourselves, we worship ourselves, we're not connected to God, we worship created things rather than creator God. Jesus comes into human history, lives a life without sin, a perfect, unbroken, ceaseless, unending worship. He goes to the cross, he dies for my sins, paying my penalty. He rises to conquer my enemies of sin and death. And then he sends the Holy Spirit in me to reconnect me to the living God. And now I can be a worshiper because I'm connected back to God through Jesus. And the sin problem has been overcome. And not only am I connected to worshiping through Jesus, we're connected to worshiping Jesus, okay? Okay. Part of the reason for this is that he is the glory of God and he is the God of glory. That Jesus is to be for us alone in that position of glory. 
Uh, it says this in John 1.14, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only. Jesus is the only one who is worthy of the position of glory. No one goes into the position of glory. Not a parent, not a spouse, not, not a child, not a friend, not a pet, not a hobby, not a rock star, not, a, not an event, not an education, not an experience, not a food, not a drink. The position of glory is reserved for Jesus Christ, the one and only. And we are to worship Jesus in that position of glory by making sacrifices of our time and our talents and our treasure for the cause of Jesus. Jesus was worshiped in the Old Testament before he ever entered into human history as a man. Okay? Some of you remember the story, Isaiah 6. Isaiah is a guy, teens, 20s, young guy, whatever it is. He has this amazing day where heaven opens up, sort of the curtains peel back. We'd all love to see that, right? So heaven opens up, and what does he say? I saw the Lord, it's gonna be the Lord Jesus, seated on a throne, ruling and reigning as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, like Revelation, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne. And what was around this great God that he saw on the throne? The angels. And what were they doing? Crying out, singing out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty. Heaven and earth are filled with his what? Glory. There's our word. You go to John chapter 12, verse 41. He says, Isaiah, or he says that Isaiah saw Jesus and wrote these things. Right? He says it in fact this way. I want to get the quote right. John 12, 41. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Who did Isaiah see six, 700 years before Jesus entered human history, seated on a throne, worshiped by the angels as the Lord? He saw Jesus in glory, the position of preeminence, prominence, superiority, priority, weightiness, gladness, the source of joy, the fountain of hope the true living eternal God that alone does not disappoint the creator. Jesus was worshiped in eternity past. He was also worshiped during his time on the earth as a man. I've got this in your notes, but a blind man worshiped him. A demonized man worshiped him. Thomas the doubter worshiped him. His buddy John worshiped him. All the disciples worshiped him. Groups of women worshiped him. James and John's mother worshiped him. Angels worshiped him at his birth. Churches worship him throughout the New Testament, including those in the beginning of Revelation. Mary, his own mother, worshiped him. James and Jude, his own brothers, worshiped him. Little kids got around Jesus and sang to him and worshiped him. And Paul, his own enemy, ultimately worshiped him as well as God. Here's where I want to take you. Jesus was worshiped prior to his birth. Jesus was worshiped during his life on the earth. The question is, what is happening today around the living, exalted Jesus. What's happening right now? Right now, if we had the experience of Isaiah and heaven opened up and the curtains were pulled back and we saw Jesus, what would we see? I'll take you through Revelation. We'll do the whole book in a couple minutes. You ready? If you got a Bible, go there. Uh, if not, I'll just read and you can follow along. We'll start in Revelation chapter 4. John has an experience like Isaiah where heaven opens up and he gets to see what's going on in heaven. And he gets to see Jesus seated on his throne like Isaiah did, being worshiped as Isaiah saw. Say, why does this matter? Well, it matters because we're here to worship Jesus. And when we see how Jesus is being worshiped by angels and people and creatures, it shows us how worthy Jesus is to be the object of glory and the object of our worship and praise above all else. And Revelation breaks down into two scenes. There are heavenly scenes with Jesus being worshiped, and there's earthly scenes of sin and chaos. And so we'll look at a few of the heavenly scenes, beginning in Revelation chapter 4, verse 9. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the what? On the throne. You get this picture of a king, of Jesus ruling and reigning in authority, and who lives forever and ever, no beginning, no end, Jesus is eternal God. The 24 elders, the spiritual leaders, fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever, and they lay their crowns at the throne. And Elizabeth, the longest reigning British monarch, she said, I wish Jesus would return in my lifetime so that I could fall at his feet and I could lay my crown at his feet. 
Right? That's exactly what happens here. All of the, the, these important men with crowns on their head get down on their faces, take their crowns off their head, and lay them at the feet of Jesus. And then they sing. Worship includes singing, though it is not solely reserved to that. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive what? Glory. Jesus, you alone are worthy of being in that position of glory and honor and power for you created all things. By your will, they were created and have their being. That's the scene in heaven. Leaders worshiping Jesus, giving him glory as he sits on the throne in the position of glory. Chapter five, verse 11, another glimpse. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels. So here are the angels worshiping Jesus. It's amazing how people worship angels and the angels worship Jesus. People are just supposed to worship Jesus like the angels. Numbering thousands upon thousands, this is quite a choir. And 10,000 times 10,000, they encircled the throne. Jesus is seated, seated on the throne. And the living creatures and the elders, in a loud voice, they sang, worthy is the lamb. Who's that? Jesus, who died to take away our sins, to reconnect us to God so that we could go from being idolaters to worshipers so we wouldn't need to break the first two commandments, that we could have one God and worship him at all times, ways, and places, living to his glory alone, which in and of itself is the only path to our joy. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Jesus died for my sins to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and 